Welcome to the Long Thread Podcast about spinning, stitching, and weaving by hand. The podcast is presented by Long Thread Media, publishers of Spin Off, Handwoven, Piecework, and Little Looms magazines. Find us online at longthreadmedia.com. Trainway Silks is where weavers, spinners, knitters, and stitchers find the silk they love. Select from the largest variety of silk spinning fibers, silk yarn, and silk threads and ribbons at trainwaysilks.com. You'll discover a rainbow of colors thoughtfully hand dyed in Colorado. Love natural? Trainway's array of wild silks provide choices beyond white. If you love silk, you'll love Trainway Silks, where superior quality and customer service are guaranteed. I'm your host, Long Thread Media co founder Ann Marrow. Stephanie Wilkes is a sheep shearer and wool classer. Her book, Raw Material Working Wool in the West, was published in 2018. Stephanie, thanks for being with me. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. So you have a really interesting background. You are a certified wool shearer. Yes. That is such an interesting thing to do. Can you tell me, you know, how you got to do that and how you're doing that in your life today? Yes. And it's 2023 is an interesting year to be doing this because it did actually mark 10 years. So it was almost difficult for me to believe that I've been doing this that long. Uh (laughs) Time flies when you're having fun, I guess. As I mentioned in my book, I was really curious about, and I am in general like this, about a lot of things. Like I am really fascinated by structural systemic issues Mm. that get in the way of things. So whether that is like schooling funding or international shipping, I tend to just kind of deep dive. I'm like, what's, but what's really the core issue? And so when I moved out West, I knew all the sheep were here and I couldn't find local yarn. And I started to dig into the systemic reasons for that because that really didn't make sense to me when I could drive an hour north of my house and see all of these gorgeous sheep and like, where was the yarn? And one of the things I heard about at actually the inaugural Fiber Shed Wool Symposium, which was in November 2012, was that there was a shortage of sheep shearers. Mm -hmm. So this is where I call it, like, I'm also like, so many people a victim of urban hubris yep (laughs) because I like to learn new things and I really thought sharing was just another thing that I could go out and learn which is it's not true (laughs) I did (laughs) but it was so hard I had never done anything remotely that hard physically grueling and so sensory involved and like holding this heavy animal that is this whole other living being that has is a different species and has its own needs So I just was like, well, maybe, maybe this is just something I can do. You know, I'll try it. And there were a lot of people at that symposium who had really small flocks and couldn't find somebody to come out and shear their sheep. So I thought, well, I'll try it. And then that following May, um, I went to my first shearing school at the University of California, Hopland, which was, it's a site where different people run shearing schools out of, but I did that school that year and I actually also attended for the next two years because I wanted to keep getting better. I don't know if that actually answered the question. I was trying (laughs) to remember some of it as I went. (laughs) There's a big difference between deciding that you're interested in and wanting to investigate something and actually going and participating in something where you have to throw a 150 pound animal around. That's a big leap. It is. I think I have always been like pretty physically active. So I did play some sports in grade school and stuff. And I, you know, did triathlons for a bit. So I like physical challenge. But this was a very different physical challenge. Yes. Yeah. But there is something I think, too, especially once you get through your first like handful of sheep. So by I really, really did want to quit. Like, let me not. I almost quit on the third day. <laughs> They run school a little differently now, I think, to try and retain folks. You know, I taught this year. That was another milestone is that I actually taught sharing beside the two instructors who taught me. So I had a very emotional first day because I never, ever, ever would have thought I'd be teaching beside the two men who taught me to share. Like, no way. But there is something addictive about it. Once you, and it's like, I think anything with hand eye, I I think it is like when you knit your first few rows and they start Mm -hmm. to look like knitting or when you can finally, you know, you're spinning and maybe the roving, the roving doesn't just like break and like fly off without you. When you start to kind of get something, I think there is something in our brains that's like, 
keep going. <laughs> Gives you that little reward to like get over the hurdle. But you do, once you know it like a little bit, you kind of want to get better. Right. You know, at least that's how it is for me. So I think that that played into it. And then you definitely like with knitting, like with spinning, I think you see the outcome of this nice clean sheep. Mm-hmm. And you see the sheep feel better. You know, wool is heavy. I tell people like, Sometimes a merino can be carrying a 16 to 20 pound fleece right. every year. So yeah. if you get a sheep that hasn't been sheared in a couple of years, they are carrying like 40 and 50 pounds on top of their 100, 120 pound frame, right? right. So uh-huh. think about that for a minute. And then imagine they lose it in five or 10 or 15 minutes. And what they feel like when they first like stand up <laughs> with Strong. 20 to 50 pounds less, right? It's a, and they can feel that air and the sun on their skin. They're really, they're really pretty happy about it. Yeah. <laughs> There's all these positive feedback loops. But it wasn't just that you went and learned how to shear sheep. This kind of became a, a larger endeavor. So you explored other parts of the American wool process and also helped support founding a local mill. Is that right? Yes. I think that is a generous term given. Now I'm looking back on how much labor the actual mill owners, who are Matt and Sarah Gilbert of Mendocino Wool and Fiber, have put into that mill. I have done uh, a fraction of the work that they have done. When I try to think of like the roles I like to play, I kind of want to do everything and you can't Mm -hmm. do everything. So I try to be a little enzyme. You know, that's how I think of it now. I'm like, I'm an enzyme. I just kind of like help get things started. And then when they're rolling, you know, just try to be like a supporter because we can't all do everything. And so my, yes, my friend Kate and I did give the Mendocino Wool and Fiber Mill its initial investment with which they bought some equipment. And it was one of those things where like I had a little, I honestly forget if it was like ten or $15,000 CD at a bank that was going to expire. And so did she. And, and then I did attend some of the meetings with the Ukiah Planning Commission to try yeah. to get them to permit the wool to open, which was a far, far greater struggle than just, you know, trying to find equipment. And I will say too, that was a huge community endeavor. Like it certainly wasn't just me. There were lots of people who wanted to see that mill open and the fiber community in Northern California really, really rallied for that. There was also uh, what grew out of that was a community investing opportunity. So it was, I think it's the Economic Development and Finance Incorporation of Mendocino County. I could be wrong. It's like EDFC is, is the name. And they did a community fundraising effort called a direct public offering. Huh. So people could, and I believe the minimum investment was $1,000, they could buy shares of the mill. So it is like a stock offering, but it's to the community. And then it's like held by the community. So that raised a quarter million dollars. Wow. Which, because when you're dealing, when you're starting with literally a garage and you have to have equipment, power, you know, humidity controls, that was a big thing. So it was a huge community effort to get that mill open. We'd also done a GoFundMe early on or Kickstarter to get the initial money together. So there were like three kind of things. And they are now, I forget if they have seven or eight employees now. Wow. Yeah. And they're doing really beautiful work. Sarah Gilbert is, I mean, she's just such a talented yarn designer. You know, all all y'all hand spinners now, (laughs) when you've been hand spinning since you're like, like child, her sense of yarn design is like otherworldly. I really mean this. Like she, and she's a trained wool classer as well. And her husband's a shearer. And so Sarah has handled, you know, more, she's run more fleeces and seen more fleeces and spun probably more than most people will in a lifetime. And so she can see raw fibers come into the mill and really get a sense of like, this should be with this. This would be a great blend. This is how it's going to run through the equipment. Her yarn R&D skills are just fantastic. So I think that's part of what's helping them do so well is that like, it's really good. So it's really good stuff. (laughs) Maybe it's just selfishness. I hear these things. I'm like, maybe I'm just really selfish because now I have great yarn in my backyard. (laughs) You know, create, help create the kind of world you want to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of thing. Well, a lot of what you're writing about in your book, Raw Material, is kind of the, the gap between the fluffy sheep in the field and the needles. And, you know, I think knitters, weavers, spinners have a a concept that we want to connect more with local wool. But 
you know, starting with shearing and then going to a mill, you really kind of explored all of the different areas and and challenges between those. Yes. There's so much more interest in local wool. What have you seen happen and change since you started? Oh, wow. That's a great question. And it's hard because, you know, it can be very discouraging, especially when you have like, you're trying to keep a mill open through COVID, like constant changing regulations or like we've had so many fires. Mm-hmm. What And I probably only speak for... Well, it can probably only speak for the West, some of the Western states. I have seen, I have to remind myself sometimes, I, I actually have to go back to 10 and 15 years ago, because otherwise right. sometimes you can't tell something has changed. Pretty much most yarn shops I go into now have some kind of local or at least American manufactured yarn. There are a ton more choices than we had. And it's hard to remember, but like I say in my book, and bless them, you know, Lamb's Pride was the only Amer- all-American product that I could find. And they're still a wonderful, still actually one of my favorite yarns was Lamb's Pride, especially they're bulky. I love it. Mm-hmm. And they've been like soldiering on for forever. But now there's like, I mean, you know, all the major brands are doing some kind of local line now. I don't know much about the supply chains, but I even saw the other day like Lion Brand has something they're calling local and it's mm-hmm. an all-American wool product, Quince and Company, Brooklyn Tweed, like and the farm yarns, I think, because of the internet, are easier to find. So I have seen some of my favorite farms, you know, Meridian Jacobs and Versace, which is Sally Fox's Cotton, and right. Lonnie's Lana, and like Winging a Prayer Farm, and Ironwater Ranch. All those folks have such strong online and festival presences that it's easier, at least, to find than I think it used to be. Like, I used to have to really search out a local festival Or you'd have to go to Stitches, the older versions of Stitches West, where some of those folks would kind of come in for maybe one. That was like their one booth that a smaller line might do that year or something. So I've also seen, you know, even taking local fibers all the way through to fabric. So I could not find clothes, forget trying to find clothes, even like 15 (laughs) years ago that had Mm -hmm. a documented like all American supply chain, much less one where you can take it all the way back to the ranch. And track that ranch's regenerative methods. And I think that is super important. So we are seeing like where are some places you get close and, you know, different price points, but like Gamine out of the Northeast and California Cloth Foundry, you know, people who are taking these really, really prime materials that are using very good farming practices and turning them all the way into clothes. Is, is a huge convenience factor. And again, the internet has made those easier to find. And there's so many, I'm not going to be able to name them all, but you know, sure. I see ads yeah. all the time on like, this American sweater, or, well, leggings are getting really popular. I think there's more attention around microfibers and microplastics in our bodies, in our drinking water, in the ocean, and like how it's fundamentally, we just need to do what we can to stop these things from entering the environment. And and I think uh, fiber shed And other organizations like ecological outcome verifications, there are all of these certifications now in the textile industry, actually trying to get more up to speed on the recent ones for a a project I'm working on, where there's a greater connection between, and I think greenwashing, right, has made made this kind of necessary, but also more interesting is that like, you know, fiber sheds climate beneficial verification where they're going out, there's soil samples. There's people doing diverse pasture management. Like you can, and I say this because I work on the land. It's really easy for me, right? Because I'm like, oh, I'm out there on the farms. I can just go check it out for myself and decide where I want my yarn to come from. But I'm not suggesting everybody do that, but that's what the certifications are for. It's to try to document. And sometimes I think overly quantify. I have an issue with trying to quantify everything because it's not really how ecosystems work. But that's a stand-in for everybody being able to like trounce out and, and have the eyes to see like what's going on in a pasture. So I think from just being able to find people to like people caring more about sourcing and better documentation, getting up about that, where these things really come from when everybody, we know. I'm laughing now about like the reaction of the oil industry that's like, we're going low carbon. I, you know, I went through an <laughs> eco center too. I went to visit my mom, you know, in October. So I did go through an airport because I was trying to see my mother. But, you know, they're like, this airport will be carbon neutral. I'm like, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, let's not kid ourselves here. But anyway, <laughs> so I think that there, there's been a lot of great things happening. And I certainly did not have a local mill that had seven or eight employees. And so you said that you're out on the out on the ranches. Is 
Is that doing shearing work? Is that what you're doing as your as your work right now? Oh, yeah. I've had a shearing business for 10 years now, which I can't wow. believe. And, you know, I have to say the sad thing. The one thing that marks it for you is that, right, sheep have an average lifespan of like oh. 11 to 14 years. And it's only been in the past year and two, really, like unless something happened to them, like there was an accident or they had some kind of sickness that was unexpected. Like some of my sheep clients are dying. Oh, And I was like, oh, God, nobody told me about this part that like I would go to check in with somebody and they'd say, I'm sorry. You yeah. know, I hate to tell you, you know, Jupiter died or oh. Eva died. And I'm like, oh, God. And they're like, we're so glad we have her fleece from last year. So like not to be a downer, it's wow. just that it really does hit you how long you've been sure. doing something when that little lamb is now is now gone. And you saw them every year of their lives almost. You feel like yeah. you really had like a relationship with them. And they do, you know, sheep are not as stupid as everybody says. No. Nope. And they do recognize faces. And I do think they... The more they're handled and the more you handle them, like, I swear, some of these sheep kind of, not to anthropomorphize, but they're like, oh, you again? Like, is this what we're doing today? <laughs> and some are like, some are like, really don't like being sheared, especially yeah. if they're like Shetlands or Navajo Churro or something. They're like, I'm just going to go in the corner of my pen when I see her on the property, knowing <laughs> I just don't really want to do this, but it's kind of like a doctor appointment. Oh. So yes, I've been doing it for 10 years. I am really, and then this year was my first year teaching a traditional like week long class. The past couple of years, I just can only take so much work. And there's only so much work I want to do on my body because I don't want to break my body. And I do sharing and I do hoof care. And I'm mm-hmm. trying to get better with actually, I've, I've really stepped up my education with a place that's called Progressive Hoof Care Practitioners. And they do barefoot trimming, including for horses, donkeys and mules. Oh, and that's yeah. because when I was going out on these landscapes, see, I can't stop learning. It's like a sickness. I would go out on these farms and, you know, sometimes I've traveled quite a ways to get to a certain place and I'd see all these lame animals, like really bad hoof situations. And it's not malicious. I want to be full. 99% of the time, somebody doesn't know. They took in an animal from a neighbor who died or they found it on Craigslist. It needed a place to live. And the person has done that. And we're in that transitional period where they're, I have this new animal. I'm not sure what it needs. I'm learning. I'm learning. You know, I might have sheep and goats and alpaca and a donkey. And like, there's a lot to learn there. And especially most farmers in this country have day jobs of at least some kind, one or more, part-time or more. So give folks some credit. Don't. It's not always like an animal abuse situation at all. And they don't even know they're lame because if they're standing, right, we don't know that like tapping a hoof, it can be a sign of discomfort, stay away from me in one animal. It can be a sign of I'm having trouble standing comfortably in another animal, right? So I'm getting more into like, so it's shearing and a hoof care day sometimes. That's a lot of bodily effort. It's not just showing up always to shear two or three sheep and leave. It's sometimes a lot more bodily work than that. So that's some of the stuff that I see when I go out there and why I end up on all these farms. And I'm I'm trying to offload some of my business, actually. So when I see students come through school now, or I know somebody's like, they went to school a couple of years ago, and I know that they're working in a certain area. I'm at the stage in my life now where I am trying to build up those other businesses because I really need other shearers to be around. So, and that's hard. I'm working on that this year. I have a meeting this week. (laughs) I just did in August, like our first, what I would call a community shearing day. So a ranch had contacted Fiber Shed and they, they have about a hundred sheep and they're doing what we call like livestock integrated cropping systems where you bring sheep through, you know, artichoke, stubble where it's dry stock and they graze the dry stock down, Brussels sprout stocks and things like that instead of using, you know, petrochemicals and fertilizers. And a lot of folks are more interested in that. That's another really hopeful thing I'm seeing. But those animals need care. And if you were a crop person, you may not know about animal care. You may or you may not, or maybe even cattle, but you didn't have sheep. We see a lot of that. So I was able to say, okay, this is a kind of a good number of sheep for a day for my students who've been through school. So we had students from two of the Northern California shearing schools, and I was able to invite six students. It's just what that farm had capacity for in terms of space and the number of animals. And I was like, we could have three stands of two shearers so they can take turns and not burn out their bodies. I'll be on hand as an instructor. And they can do like an apprentice day. They got paid. I want every student coming out of shearing school to have 
three to five of those to go to after school every year. I don't know how to set that up. It's very hard with the season and with where people live and like the West is so big. We're going to get there. But now I'm I'm really trying if I know somebody who really wants to get out and work after sharing school or they've come out on a couple jobs or they've done like a two sheep job near their house. Every time I get a request now, I'll be like, call him, call her, call them. Because what I really want is what we are seeing and the fire is driven some of this. I want more sheep. And if people have a reliable shearer who is close enough to be affordable enough to come, they can get more sheep. That's what everybody tells me. I'm like, oh my gosh, wow, you're 15 minutes down the road from this guy I just taught two years ago. You can have him and they're like, great, now we can get more sheep. Because people would tell me I could never grow beyond the number of sheep that I could do on a stand like myself. And so I'm hoping that those relationships actually work and that people can kind of like stay where they are and have some longevity because for grazing, for fire, for fuel load, for reducing fertilizer use, and having a shearer who can come and serve those animals, or if they get like a new sheep that hasn't been sheared in five years, the shearer can just come. It's better for animal care. It's better for the landscape. It's better for everybody economically. It's The shearer doesn't have to drive as much. It's like a much more humane. When I was a kid, we had a couple of sheep and they were, one of them was, uh, had been raised by with dogs. And I think eating dog food, it was terrible. And there yeah. was another one that there was an auction for this sheep that you could either have on the hoof or in butcher paper. And it was like the carnivores versus the vegetarians and the vegetarians won, but they all lived in apartments. So my family wound up with the sheep and they had to be shorn every year. And we had horses. So somebody came for hoof care, but we would put the two sheep in a truck and take them over to the local extension where they would have a shearing day. We couldn't fit more than two sheep in the truck. So that was kind of our limit. One year, my dad tried shearing, but my dad's afraid of the sight of blood and he said, it's hard to tell where the sheep leaves off and the wool begins. And so he only did that once. <laughs> Those are my favorite people, by the way, because <laughs> when I get that email and I get, I, get, I get like one good one every year from a new person who's like, I tried to do it myself. Please come. I'll pay you whatever you want <laughs> to not have to do it again. And I, I don't take advantage of it, but I'm like, you, right. know, you know how hard it is. Like, I like you because you're not going to be like, how did you do that? This is really hard because I will not nerd out on this. <laughs> like 90% of safety, I think, is the equipment setup. Mm. It's like the choice of the comb and cutter, how sharp it is. It should be really, really sharp. It should not be used out of the box and how you've set it up on your handpiece. And you've got to like, I spent a lot of time on that at my school. I was almost like, okay, okay, students, like set your handpieces and I'll check them because if there's so much nuance. And if you like set the cutter too far forward, you'll cut them. Even if you had the handpiece in the perfect spot and you were gliding along the sheep's body. So there's a lot of nuance with any kind. Anytime you're using like, right, a carpenter, I'm sure would tell you the same thing. Anybody with a fishing rod, anybody with a hunting rifle, like you have to keep your equipment clean. You have There's a lot going on on the positioning. But I will say once you've got the sense of the equipment in your hand, you do start to be able to feel the sheep's body through the handpiece. You know, you were speaking about integrating sheep into other kinds of agriculture. And I know that in Mendocino County, there are folks who graze sheep on their on their vineyards and that there are actually several other, you know, flippantly, I'll say rent a sheep, but, um, you know, places where you can have sheep come in for just a little while. It's such an interesting way of having sheep in the landscape. Yes, I think so. And it's one of the things that makes me most hopeful for... I guess what I kind—I don't want to say it because I feel like this is um, rebuilding pastoralism, but I don't want to say that because pastoral cultures are very ancient and <laughs> unbroken, and I don't want to imply that that's what we're doing. But yes, because of our fires, so out here in the West in particular, our 2017 to 2022 fire season was really bad. And in 2020 in particular, the American West had a massive lightning strike storm where you don't get rain and you have a really bad drought in parched grasses and it lit fires everywhere. Like if you looked at a map, they were like, Idaho was on fire and California was on fire and they just kept popping up. But if there has to be a silver lining, it's that people are now really convinced of the value of skilled forestry. I don't want to say like logging or anything extreme. No, but forest management, healthy forest management, of the sort that Native folks did before in 1910, the U.S. Forest Service stopped 
burning and grazing for fire risk. And so you have anywhere from a two acre property with two sheep or that might need just four goats for a couple of days to what I know Fiber Shed's been working on building it now is contiguous grazing. So the sheep can move from, say, through a homeowners association Hello. onto the border of a golf course, you know, through a reservation or a rancheria out to a state park. I'm generalizing there. That might not be an exact, but there are areas like that where you want this whole area because the safety from fire comes from like basically a regional or area wide management. So we're seeing lots more sheep in places. And then also, like you said, orchards and vineyards where you want to reduce the labor and fuel of mowers and tractors. And Mendocino County was actually, I'm seeing more and more stories about growing grapevines higher. And as far as I know, Mendocino County was one of the first places in the world to figure out if we plant the grapes, you know, if we make things taller, the sheep can graze underneath them and won't jeopardize the grape harvest. Yeah. (laughs) So you see a lot of those higher vines in Mendocino County than just about anywhere else. And I think I'm seeing some really interesting work from the resource, resource conservation districts who are really instrumental in getting funds and support to farms and ranches in their areas about integrating sheep and goats into cropping systems. Because cropping is super intensive on the soil, right? It's a very intensive form of farming. And most of the world's landscapes are not actually great for crop farming. There's not enough water. The soil is really not right. And that's something that kind of, you know, I could go on and on about that, but that England kind of took to India and it was like, let's let's have this row crop style of farming that gets taken to all these different countries, including what's now the United States. Most of the American West, not suitable for crop farming. You don't want to do it. It's super destructive. So bringing in those animals that can deposit manure in the soil, that can nibble the plants down, that can really help manage invasive species. Uh by, you know, grazing these plants down before they have time to like rebuild and outgrow the natives. That's some really cool work that's happening. But I do really, I did see a shift like after a couple of years of horrible fires where people were just much more open to this kind of thing happening. And contract grazing, you know, it's a good business. I feel like it's also kind of about to pop. There's some people doing it, but I think it's going to become much bigger as a business. I know some folks doing very well with contract grazing. (laughs) labor intensive skill intensive you're out there all the time and all the weather i'm not saying it's easy but that is proving to be i think a good business now is there a wool part of that story are these mostly animals who are i mean one of the things you talk about in your book is that no matter what all the sheep need to be shorn like unless you're raising sheep, they all have to be shorn (laughs) so is there a way that the wool is being valued differently or treated differently as part of this story so you're right There are wool sheep who are doing grazing, and there are also, I'm so excited because I just started working on a cashmere project. I know. Talk about like cashmere in America versus China (laughs) or Mongolia. Like what? Yeah. So there, I'm working on a project with Happy Goat, USDA funded. USDA funded. They're wonderful. And we're trying to see about using cashmere contract grazing goats and getting a fiber supply chain out of that. It's going to be really interesting because in case y'all didn't know, there are like 12 different kinds of fiber growing goats and they're all called cashmere basically. So there's some breed differences. I will not nerd out on that either. I'm learning a lot about cashmere. I'm learning a lot about cashmere. But yes, there are lots of wool sheep who are grazing and there are hair sheep as well. So hair sheep are just kind of like a hair goat. Like they're not growing a fiber. They don't really need to be shared. They're fine as they are. And I think that's appropriate sometimes because contract grazing, the animals can contract graze fine. For fiber quality, you have to be careful about where they're going, what they're picking up in terms of what we call vegetable matter from, you know, they're going through dense thickets sometimes. Um, They're picking up burrs. They're picking up foxtails. So some of our stuff in the American West, especially is kind of gnarly. It's like needles and sharp. And if they're going through these kind of areas at certain times, you have to watch fiber length in shearing time of year and fiber quality, because unless you want the vegetable matter to be carbonized out, which is like a more energy intensive process, right? Like it's going to affect the quality of the wool. So, you know, that's just where there's a consideration of what kinds of landscapes the sheep are moving through when they get sheared and what impact that has on your fiber quality. 
some breeds need to get sheared twice a year. So Navajo churro, which do really well out here, they get sheared twice a year. And I know some ranchers that just say, well, this is my crap shearing. And the next one's the fiber shearing. Right. Because the one like in May or June, if you share, they're full of every kind of sticker picker grass, et cetera. And it's really fun when you're shearing because just I wear long sleeves. You'll all see shearers and like little tank tops, not me out here. Cause like I have, I lost my arms like once. It was just like goodbye arms, like Ooh. bleeding cut arms from all these burrs. But that's where some folks will just have like a sacrifice shearing if they're grazing those kinds of landscapes. And then in the autumn, you know, it might be nice fiber because that's all gone to see. They're kind of, so you might see some variation in the season, but that's where they're definitely like chaos sheep outfit. I'm not supposed to say how many sheep somebody has. I learned that in the West, like asking about sheep is like asking how much money somebody has. Oh, <laughs> really? And I'd be like, oh, how many <laughs> sheep do you have? And they're like rude. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I'm the shearer. I have to know. <laughs> yeah, you but, would have to know. <laughs> yeah. But chaos sheep outfit has a huge operation. That's Robert and Jamie Irwin. They are some of my favorite people on the earth. And they're grazing tons of vineyards, almond orchards, you know, all kinds of stuff. And so it's been really I'm so pleased with it, but I, I, we just need hundreds, of, in my opinion, we need hundreds of thousands more sheep. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow, <laughs> you can breed them fast enough. You know, this is sort of an aside, but speaking about your arms, one of the things I found fascinating in your book was talking about wet wool and how in shearing school, they were like, you never shear wet wool. Mm-hmm. And just what that can actually do to the shearer. Yes. And Now, somebody out there is probably going to be some real scientist. I'm going to just tell you like the shearing folklore and that I have that that people actually see in their bodies. So the theory is that, well, the sheep are just harder to handle. So that's the first thing, a safety issue. It's a basic safety issue because the sheep are full of oil and it's really hard to express to people. You've touched a real life sheep, especially with high lanolin. You put your hand on that fleece and it's oily. It's just full of oil. And so when you put, anytime you can buy water and oil, you get slippery. So imagine that the sheep is wet and there's oil and you're trying to like safely handle it on a floor where you're slipping because the water and oil has also come together on the floor. It's like an ice rink. It's hard to even express like how dangerous it is. So then you're supposed to what, like use this high powered equipment and it's, it's very dangerous for the sheep. It's very dangerous for the shearer. So that's the first thing is just a basic safety issue. But in addition, as a bonus, because of the friction when you're holding the sheep, you know, your skin and the wool have this friction. Um, you can do like a light excoriation of your skin and your skin wants to draw in that water and that moisture. And of course, any bacteria that was living in the sheep is going to go into your skin and you can get what's called shearer's boils. Oh, and you'll see these huge boils erupt on people's arms and on their thighs if they were wearing shorts and they held the sheep. So those are the two big reasons we do not share wet. And then there's also the wool. The wool can kind of like start to rot or compost if it's like pressed together because it's still generating heat because wool is warm when it's wet, right? It's not great for if you want your fiber to stay nice and go to the mill. So this, this past winter was a real challenge that way because we had rain after our forever drought it rained from basically december through march and i all my sharing was april through june it compressed a six-month season into like three because it just kept raining and my customers would be like i'm sorry i tried to get them in i didn't they're wet and now there's 17 trees across the driveway anyway so you're not getting it so yeah it's always an adventure but yeah you don't we don't share wet man there's you know there's so many interesting stories in your book but i actually one of the things i want to talk about is you said saying here that all wool is sold on reputation. And I was thinking about how if you're a knitter who's interested in buying from a fiber shed or buying from a small mill, absolutely that makes sense that you would choose the flock. But it's very interesting to learn that even on a commodity scale, wool is sold Mm -hmm. on reputation. That there are certain farms and ranches that are known for having great wool. Yes, I feel like just one of the luckiest things in my life to have seen some of those flocks in those places. So when I said, yes, wool is sold on reputation, even in the commercial or commodity market through wool brokers. And I should just say, I I keep referring to the American West, but because of the change in landscape between, let's say, the Mississippi River and the Rockies, and then the Rockies to the ocean, the landscape lends itself to finer wool. So 
Surprise, if you're feeding your sheep too much, the excess feed goes into making their wool coarser. And so, yes, it makes wow. it literally makes the, it, the surplus makes the follicle like dense, like bigger huh. and thus coarser. So wool is on micron size and it's finer. So what you see is that just most of those really, I'm not saying they're not some fine fibers east of the Mississippi, but just their grazing territory and the way they move and they're not overeating, they're grazing and moving, it lends itself to finer fibers. And over the years, some of those families are what's called a reputation clip. So in every, I think I go over this in the book, but like I always laugh when somebody talks about how difficult, like some some brand would talk about how hard it is to track fibers. I'm like, no, it's not because the ranch has a number and the wool classer has a number and that all goes on the bale label. So right away, the bale, you know, who classed it, maybe sometimes who, you know, who sheared it. If you knew enough about the classing in the ranch, the ranch, you can track it down to that operator. And if at any point somebody had hair sheet mixed in, or black wool with white wool because commercial industry wants it all to dye the same way or had too many grades together in the same bale and it was mislabeled, they're not going to be trusted. And then you have brands almost competing for the really good flock sometimes on private sales. So early on, I think I'd only been shearing for a year or two and I was certainly a new wool classer. I got invited to a ranch in northeastern Washington. It's outside of Ellensburg near Snoqualmie Pass. Amazing, amazing place. Wolves the whole bit, like great. Wow. Not, not for sheep ranchers, but hearing wolves at night when you're not used to that is is really something. And that was a reputation clip for Pendleton. Pendleton liked to buy their wool. It was a very well-managed operation because you shear the finest sheep first. We sort the sheep the night before. So I walk through, there's no there's no black face sheep and with white face sheep, the finest wool goes first because you don't want any contaminants even on the shearing plywood. Uh-huh. You're sweeping between every sheep, you know, different breeds are sheared in different order so you don't combine. We were very, very careful because that ranch was going to decide maybe to see if they could get bids, but they also knew that they had a repu- they were a reputation clip for Pendleton who wanted to direct buy from them sometimes. And they're very, oh my God, these animals are so healthy. They're so well managed, you know, because you don't want breaks in the wool. Right. You don't want stress on the animals shows up in the wool, whether it's nutrition Uh stress. And like, it's funny because I see people like, oh, these sheep are treated like it's an industrial animal. I'm like, you literally cannot treat a sheep badly and get a high wool price. I mean, I guess technically you could for a while, but like you're not going to achieve a reputation clip on animal stress. So, you know, people get to know the ranches with the really good wool and the brands will bid higher on them. I've heard again, you know, a lot of this is hearsay. I'm not looking at like this, this year's auction numbers from a private wool broker, but in my experience, that's what it means. And and those folks deserve it. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things you said was that they would shear the, shear the breeze in a different order. And, and I've seen a lot of interest in breed specific wools. Is that something that you see as a shearer? Are you noticing that change? Well, I think that's the difference between a commercial flock and a, I call those spinners flocks because we like diversity, right? Mm -hmm. So we only go to that trouble when we're sorting, like you kind of have a wool class or walk through and sort the sheep ahead of shearing. That's for a commercial job. That's so that we can shear, you know, 200 of the finest merino, kind of be only dealing with those fleeces, get them bailed and labeled properly. Then the next group, maybe it's Suffolk Merino crosses that somehow happened and it's going to be a coarser wool, right? So if if we're able, we do that. On a farm, a smaller flock, often you're going to know the sheep by name. You're going to be able to on site be like, that is a BFL Jacob cross. Or at least you get like this if you're me after a while. You're like, that one is a Shetland and something else like, you know. <laughs> but I think the farmers tend to know the sheep really well. You're at that scale where you can know the breed. The farms I work with tend to, especially for fiber sheep, they're really tracking lineage and crosses and like what percentage of Wesson versus Shetland or like who the sire was on those lambs, right? Because we're looking at fiber quality and diversity. Mm -hmm. So sometimes those fleeces, when we're shearing those fleeces and they come off the sheep, they often know the animal on site or they're like, oh, Rachel's up next or here comes (laughs) Susan for real. And then somebody will write their name on a card. If they're not sure who it is, you know, maybe we've got 100 to 200 sheep. So it's like, oh, is that one? 
you know, is that Susan or is that Ella? Mm. You check the ear tag. Then somebody will look at the notebook and say, oh, that ear tag is Ella. Well, sometimes they'll ask me to hold the sheep so I can call out the ear tag so that they can be sure. And then somebody will write like Ella 2023 on the card. That fleece goes in its own bag or its own something or somebody carries it away from me and grabs that card and then it goes to the skirting table. And that kind of more personal card follows that fleece through the whole process so that or, you know, at least if they're going to make their own, sometimes so if they're selling single fleeces, that's that tends to be how it works. And, you know, we certainly have hand spinners come to shearing days and like want to buy the fleece right off the sheep. Or some of them have been like watching that sheep since the last year, <laughs> like I want that one. But that's kind of how a smaller operation will do that. Or at least then when they maybe they're sending their fleeces to a mill, they might at least say, here's all the Shetland Jacob. Here's all the pure Shetland. Please keep them separate. If they're combining. So that kind of stuff. Are there crosses that you particularly like? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I love shearing the farm. Okay, I have to say farm fiber sheep because, A, they tend not to be enormous because, again, everybody wants to be able to handle their animals and their breeds that are not, that just don't grow that big. Like some of those, like some of the meat breeds are like shearing small ponies, really, like these Hampshires (laughs) and Suffolk, and they're so big and they're so long legged. I really love and a lot of sheep with the BFL. A blue face Lester, like it does wonders for Jacob. You've got to watch with Shetland because they're smaller sheep with a bigger sheep sometimes. So BFL, I've seen in private and improve a lot of things. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I love Cormo. I love Cormo. I love Targi. I have a fleece from Blackberry Farm in Bolinas, and it's a is it a Shetland Gotland? Oh. And it's pure black. Wow. I was out there to do a story for Fiber Shed. I'm like, I am claiming that sheep's like, this poor sheep. It's terrible. When a shearer comes, you feel like, I want that one. It's like walking <laughs> around out there. <laughs> What's that one? <laughs> a Gotland is traditionally kind of a gray or black, very curly sheep, right? This fleece, it's got that nice Shetland floof and structure with that Gotland curl. And a lot of it washed out. Sarah scoured it for me at the mill when I was up there teaching shearing school so I could take it home. And it's got it's still like a lot of it's in locks. And I'm, I have to learn, I'm going to have to take a class to learn how to like spin better with locks because I kind of want it to be like a fringy lock flowing vest or something. I don't want to get rid of that. I was like, I could just spin this out, but then I'd be like, I've got to do something with some of the locks. So it's really cool. It's a really cool fleece. So those are some very special things. And I I think I, I really credit the Livestock Conservancy with that Shave Them to Save Them program because that has... Even me. There are breeds that like we don't have a lot of out here. So, you know, I've been buying some yarns from like farmers in Ohio or we don't have a ton of Tunis out here. We don't have the it, Florida Cracker or something like oh, that. Oh, yeah. Florida yeah. Cracker. We don't mm-hmm. have a lot of those out here. So that's been really fun to like raise awareness, I think, of what these fibers can do and what they can be like. I think between the Livestock Conservancy and Fiber Shed, there's been a lot more awareness of individual sheep, whether it's a a farm or a breed, but something that makes the wool, the world of wool seem a little bit smaller and a little bit, have a little bit more detail, a little bit more, I always want to say texture. You're right though, it's detail and texture, I think. One of the things you mentioned in the book was that you wanted to, that you were going to go back and envision your future sheep, that you were practicing sharing your future sheep. Is that something that you're still thinking about? I don't even know. She shakes her head. I shake my head. Oh my gosh. It was a great way to put pressure on myself at the time. And people are still asking, you don't have any of your own animals? I'm like, I leave my dog with my husband so much already. Like I am this one quote unquote failed livestock guardian dog. He just was a little lazy and he didn't have a lot of discipline. He wasn't raised up right either. But I feel like I neglect him when I'm out running around sharing and doing things like this because like a real genius, I took a dog that I can't really bring to a property that has, say, another livestock guardian dog oh, or a pack on because they're not going to really, he's going to be perceived as an enemy. <laughs> I don't have time to like manage the pack management. <laughs> so I truly cannot conceive of how I would A, afford land, B, take care of all these animals and C, go out and serve everybody else's. And I, I've really been tempted by contract grazing, I have to tell you, because It's so inspiring when you get to see them. Like, you know, we have places here where you see them. They're going to the same place every year. 
They're grazing the same ranches, the same parks, the same fire breaks for Cal Fire. They're to see the reduction in fuel load, but also the change in the landscape that comes from things starting to look more like they used to when there were more animals doing more grazing. You see pollinator diversity. People report moths and things that they're like, what is this moth? I never used to see it in this place. And you're like, it's connected to the grazing. I can't prove it, Mm -hmm. but I can see the species diversity because grazing tends to correspond with diversity, right? You're, You're grazing down, let's say, a monoculture of an invasive species. And I'm careful about how I use that word. I mean, more harmful than beneficial. So I'm not saying everything that's not native is somehow harmful. It's not necessarily true, but things that over time tend to be more harmful than beneficial, like say yellow star thistle, it leads to a monoculture because there's like that plant, that one plant just takes over where there might've been 40. So that's where it gets really inspiring. But I know I do not have my own sheep. And I just truly, now that I know what goes into animal care for even like five, I just cannot conceive of how I could do this work and have my own animals. Honestly, I've come to value over the past 10 years I value depth and I feel like I have more breadth than depth. So I'm ashamed of that sometimes, but there is value in seeing like a hundred farms a year because you start to make comparisons across like, wait a minute, what's going on on the landscape? It's a great way to see the land. It's like, wow, everything's going to seed earlier this year. That's weird. Or like these sheep are all getting this kind of issue Or, ah, this is the fifth farm that I've seen this on. I wonder why this is happening. There is a value in it, and it's a different value. But I'm always happy when I can say, you know what? This sheep has this, and I've seen this twice more this year, and I don't know what's going on, but, like, you might want to mention to your vet that there's, like, you know, might be a regional issue cropping up or something. So it's a really interesting way, I think, to see flocks and see the landscape, even if it's not my own animals. So you mentioned that you, you know, that shearing is seasonal and that you write. Besides your book, where else can I find your writing? Right now, some of it's private. So I'm helping two other people with their books, which are almost done. I'm so happy to say. But I do write for Fiber Shed. Everything is really on my website, but I've, I have a published work thing. So if it's coming out in the world, it's there. I write for Fiber Shed and the Ag Mag pretty regularly. Ag Mag. In the Ag Mag out of wonderful Modoc County, California, out of Cedarville. They also do the Cattle Mag. I can't say enough about that publication. Their most recent issue is about mental health and burnout in the ag communities. Oh, and wow. It's such an important issue. You know, I, I'm working on an essay now. Who knows who will ever publish it? It might just end up on my blog. I think some folks don't like to believe this, but I really question the idea that most rural people don't believe in climate change. Because all I'm seeing when I go out is a whole lot of suffering and mental health anguish from climate change. So it's like the folks, uh, we've almost learned to discount, I suspect, the people who are suffering the most. And I wonder if there's not, you know, at risk of sounding a little paranoid, a certain value in being able to diminish the voices and experiences of people who are actually living on the front lines of climate change and really personally suffering for it. So I am really wanting to explore that disconnect. I know of a couple of folks who frankly had suicide attempts. Um, and this is, uh, wow. this is because, uh, frankly, a lot of some shearers, not a lot maybe, but some shearers are also volunteer fire oh. or volunteer EMT or something in their rural communities. And so lo and behold... The shearer is the one who responds to the suicide attempt of of a fiber farmer we know, right? So I know of more than one of that situation happening. And I think, especially during the drought and the fires and just the times we're living in, that it's really hard on a lot of folks. And I think we could learn a lot from their experiences and kind of prioritizing that. And I am curious why we still keep talking about all these people with a broad a broadly like, oh, they just don't believe in climate change out there. You know, it's not my experience. Yeah, so. there's a tendency to try to write a story, I think. And also, if you hear something a lot to sort of turn it down. Yeah. So. Not to be a downer. It's just. Uh, I was going to say, on a, on a happier note, one of the <laughs> yeah. things that you mentioned was Lonnie's Lana. And I, I happen to know that you wrote about that for Spinoff Magazine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. It was a really fun opportunity. I love working with you all on that. And, you know, getting to write about something that you, you know, worked with and supported. That was 
a great experience. If anybody, if you get a chance to ever visit Warner Mountain Weavers, where mm-hmm. Lonnie's Lana is based out of in Cedarville, California, it just has to be my favorite area of California. And I really love the coast as well, obviously, but it's the high desert of California mm. in that it's on the cover of my book. And it is one of the most beautiful and remote places you'll ever see. And it is really a special place to visit. So it's it's worth every effort to get there and then learn from the wonderful team there, do one of their dye, dye sourcing and community dye days. It's, it's a really special, special place. Well, Stephanie, thanks so much for being with me. I love your book and I can't wait to read more on your website. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Long Thread Podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate the show and leave us a comment on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. Thanks again. Thanks again.